Hello. This is where we got to in part 1. We attached artwork to the bones of a 3D mocap file, and made this character. Before we check out rendering, we're going to explore some more possibilities. So import another BVH file. Let's give our character a new skeleton. Make a copy of the head with Shift D. In the object properties, select your new skeleton as the parent of the head. It is now linked to the same bone in the new skeleton. Sometimes, you'll have to position the shapes again, like this. As we'll see later, they transfer directly when using a skeleton from the same batch. Now let's have a quick look at the scene window. Here you will find your objects, in groups called collections. To help keep track, let's give our skeletons a name. This one can be run long. And this one can be run short. In the scene window, you can see your object hierarchy. But for now, let's import another BVH file. This time, a walker. Copy the head again, and attach it to the new skeleton, which we'll name walk. And tweak the head position if necessary. Now let's move on. Here I have linked the rest of the body shapes, and added a jumping person. If we look at our jumpy friend, you'll notice his hands. They need to be switched. We'll do this in the properties panel, and change the parent bone here. Find the name in the list, or simply type it. The naming convention is the same for all of the skeletons. Now, to fix their orientation, double tap R, and you can rotate the hands in 3D space. You may have noticed that our character is 187 meters tall. Impressive! You can measure this with the measurement tool here. The default size of the skeleton is very large, but we'll fix that later. For now, let's import another BVH file. We'll choose one from the same batch as our runner. He's picking up an invisible thing. This time, the body shapes should transfer directly. Duplicate the head of our runner with Shift D, and hit Return. Then, in the Relations window, change the parent to our new skeleton. The head is now positioned correctly. Do the same for the other body parts. They should all slot into place. All looks good, except the hands. They need to be switched. So, in the relations window, change the parent bone to switch the left and right hands. Now rotate the hands into position. A final tweak and they are done. To perfect our 2D view, let's quickly reposition a few body parts. Now, to demonstrate some more Blender options, let's actually make him pick something up. As he bends down, we want his left hand to open up. 
move to the frame where this should happen, and select the left hand. We are now going to edit this grease pencil object. In the grease pencil timeline, you can see the keyframes of the hand at frame 0. Select and copy these frames, and paste them at the point in the timeline just before we want them to change. Next, move ahead in the timeline by a single frame. This is where the hands will open. For clarity, I have placed a keyframe here as well. Although, the grease pencil will automatically generate a new one when you start to draw. To make life easier, let's activate onion scanning of the grease pencil properties and overlays window. To see the onion skin, tab into edit mode and get rid of the closed hand. Press A to select all, then hit delete and remove all points. Back in draw mode, select your brush and black outline material and draw your new hand. Smooth with the Sculpt tool, close the shape, and fill it. A few more tweaks and he's opening his hand. Jumping ahead, the same has now been done for his other hand. Also, by copying and repositioning the original hand frames, they now close when he puts down the invisible object. In fact, let's make something for him to pick up. It's a good opportunity to demonstrate some quick 3D Blender basics. As he's about to pick up, use the Add menu to place a 3D cube in the scene. Position and scale the cube in both the side and front character views. When you've done this, duplicate the box you made with Shift D and return. We now have two boxes. Give the copy a nice name in its object data properties window. This is a box we'll pick up. Then, in its object properties window, use the picker tool to parent the box to the skeleton. Choose bone as the parent type, and set the left hand as the parent bone. It will likely need to be repositioned, so line it up with the standing box. He now picks up the box. To perfect our 2D view, tweak the position some more. Next, we will trigger the box visibility. Just before the box is picked up, turn off its viewport and render visibility, and set keyframes in the object properties window. Now move ahead one frame, and switch the visibility back on, again adding keyframes. To see these frames, choose the dope sheet view of the timeline. Our initial box has none. Our pickup box does. Move to the first set of frames, where the pickup box is invisible. Then select our original box, and in its visibility properties, set some keyframes. One frame ahead, and we turn off its visibility, setting the last two keyframes for our box. Great, he's picking up a box. Before bringing our character down to a practical size, let's have a look at organizing our objects. Everything on the 3D stage can be found here, in the scene window. You can see the skeletons with their attached grease pencil drawings. All is stored in a scene collection, which is like a blender word for groups. Right click, and let's add a new collection. Now select your entire character, and copy it with Ctrl C. Choose the new collection we just made, and paste with Ctrl V. Hit G and give it its own special place. We now have a copy of our character in its own collection. 
This will help to keep things tidy. Select our other objects by right-clicking their collection, and move them out of the way. Grab the camera and the light, and drag them to just above the origin. Our character is clearly way too large. So select the skeleton and scale it down. We'll make him just under 2 meters tall. Reset the camera's position and rotation with Alt-G, and with Alt-R. Let's put our character on the origin, and set the camera to view it head-on. Select the camera, and change to camera view. Move along the y-axis, until the animation is nicely framed in the view. This will do nicely. Move to the front view, and let's add a background. Decide on a background picture, and press Shift A to add it as an image as planes object. To see the image, select the rendered view up here. I have used a repeating background, which will scale up so the bricks are a sensible size. Then, in the modifier properties, we'll add an array modifier, and duplicate along the x-axis. Adjust the offset distance to improve the join of the background tiles. Now add this modifier again, and do the same along the y-axis. This time, set the relative offset of x to 0 and Y to 1, again tweaking the offset distance to adjust the join. Play around with array counts and positions until you're happy with the background. Lovely! Now we'll add a simple plane as a floor, and scale it up to fit the view. Choose Render Image in the Render menu to have a quick look at the scene so far. Ta-da! Feel free to play around with the material options. And now for a brief note on shadows. Our grease pencil objects don't automatically generate shadows. We can add a shadow effect, though this remains a fake, 2D shadow. If you want realistic shadows, it is best to import your body parts as image planes. To quickly demonstrate this, let's duplicate our skeleton with Shift D, and import a PNG file as a head. You'll notice our imported object immediately casts a square shadow, responsive to our 3D light. Position the new head and attach it to the duplicated skeleton. Moving the light, and we can see the shadow respond. The grease pencil shadow effect remains unchanged. Clearly we don't want a square shadow. So in the material properties, change shadow mode to alpha hashed. Blender now uses the image outline to cast shadows. For now, let's keep working on our grease pencil character. Remove the shadow effect, and let's look at a quick cheat for a cartoon-like shadow. Add a circle mesh to our scene and position the somewhere above our character's ankles. In edit mode, select all points and press F to fill the shape. It now generates a round shadow. Parent the circle to one of your character's bones. The round mesh and its shadow now follow our animated character. However, we want it to remain parallel to the floor, so let's add an object constraint. 
from the constraints tab, choose limit rotation and constrain the X, Y and the Z axis rotation to zero. Better. Play around with its position until you are happy with your quick and dirty shadow. Now, we don't want to see the circle object. Assign a material to the circle, and in its material properties, turn on back face culling. This will prevent the underside of the material from rendering. In edit mode, rotate the circle 180 degrees, so that its underside is facing upwards. The circle is now invisible, and only its shadow can be seen. Lovely. To render the scene, choose the timeline view and enter values for your start and end frames. In the Output Properties tab, enter your render settings. Match the frame rate with your mocap file, which in this case is 60 frames per second. Now choose your preferred output format, and in the Render menu, press Render Animation. Aside from scenes like these, this technique is also very useful for creating render loops. So in the front view, make a copy of your camera and light, and we'll make a new scene. Select the new camera and press Ctrl, plus number pad 0, to make it the new default camera view. Now let's find a running animation to play with. Select an animation for your loop. This running dude will do just fine. Position and scale your character to fit the new camera view. Scrubbing through the timeline, we see he runs across the scene. We want to identify two frames in the animation that represent the start and end of a loop. In this case, where he puts his right foot down at frame 33, and again, at frame 76. Set these as our start and end frames in the timeline. Now we will move the camera so it appears he's running on the spot. Select your camera, and move it so that our character is centered at the beginning of its loop. Press I, and insert a location keyframe for our camera. Move ahead to the last frame of the loop and do the same. Try to line it up as best you can. Remember, for every adjustment, you must insert a keyframe again. When you're done, check your output settings and render the animation. Hey presto, he runs. And here we have done the same with a walk cycle. Hey presto, he's walking. You should now be able to use 3D motion capture to help with your 2D animations. I hope you enjoy your new tricks, and that it helps you to make something awesome. Good luck and happy animating. Until the next time. Bye bye.